The Tour of Flanders, a fight against appalling cobbles, a battle with gales and driving rain, and the agony of those infamous hills. It's spectacular, dramatic, it's happiness and disappointment, and it's every setback you can imagine. It also brings half of Flanders out onto the streets. But far more than all of that, the Tour of Flanders is an encyclopedia of bike racing's most famous names. The father of the Tour of Flanders was a man named Karel van Weinendaal. He stood right at the heart of Belgian bike racing. He was a pioneer and cycling hasn't forgotten him. Karel van Weinendaal knew what it was to be a bike racer. He was one himself, one of the first back at the turn of the century. And when he stopped riding he became the first real sports journalist in Flanders, in the first real sports paper. Sports World offered Flanders its own race, the Ronde van Vlaanderen, a product of Flemish folk and Flemish soil. As if writing and organizing wasn't enough, he also had his own troop of riders, taking them everywhere in the 1920s, around Flanders of course, and under an assumed name also, to the six days in New York and Chicago. He picked the Belgium team for the Tour de France for years and brought Belgium success as its team manager. Belgium won the Tour de France eight times in the 12 years after 1920. And Belgium also filled the second place ten times in those 12 years and the third place another 12 times. There's never been anybody like it in the English-speaking world, which is why Belgium has monuments in his memory. Thanks to bike racing, he became a famous and a prosperous man. It's easy to forget that he was a rider himself before he became a journalist. No sooner had the race started in 1913 than the whole world was thrown upside down the following year. But all the time he just had one thought driving him on, something that he was always dreaming. When could he start the Tour of Flanders again? On May the 23rd, 1913, it happened. The first Tour of Flanders. It went in a big loop from the middle of Ghent to Marierkerke. In all, it was 370 kilometers long with 37 riders on the start. The winner was a Belgian, Paul Demain, who also won Bordeaux-Paris, Paris-Roubaix and Paris Tours. In the first Tour de Flanders in 1913, they gave away 1,600 francs in prizes. Well, in those days, that was a tremendous amount. People used to marvel at it, and it was a big talking point. The money that was being given away to bike riders, and why? Well, at that time in 1913, a teacher was only earning 1,200 francs in a whole year. A year later, it was the turn of Marcel Buisse. He was the oldest of a Buisse dynasty, the most famous being his brother Lucien, who won the Tour de France in 1926. In fact, Marcel Buisse started in Ghent without the permission of his French sponsors, the Alcyon Bike Company, but he'd given his word to the organizers, and so he was there. Then came an unbreaking from four years. Astonishingly, just four months after the last shot was fired, the Tour of Flanders was back on the road. The race was won by one of the archetypal Flemish riders, Rita van Leerberg. He came straight from the front with all his gear, but with no bike. So he borrowed a bike from the brother-in-law of another rider, and he told the others that when the race started he was going to kill the rest of the field off in the strong headwinds. And of course the others just ridiculed him, and he said to one of them, you mustn't laugh, because I'm going to drop you just before your front door. And that's exactly what happened. On the climb at Ichtegum, Van Leerberg attacked and broke clear. The others didn't believe what he'd said, and they just let him go. By the time they started chasing, it was too late. Van Leerberg came into Ghent Brugge, but instead of riding into the velodrome where he was supposed to go, he went into a cafe, and he shouted, pour me a beer. And then he had another one, and he stayed there until in the end the race organizer heard where he was and sent his swan year in after him. 
and the soigneur had to get him out and lead him round the track. And when Van Leerberg did his lap of honour, he went to the crowd, and this is historical fact, I'm not making it up, and he just said, go off home everyone, I'm a day and a half ahead of the race. En daarna nog een, tot dat directeur Oscar Braakborn hoorde dat Rieten in dat café zat. Hij stuurde zijn verzorger naar dat café en die gelukt naar in. Rieten met een zacht geweld naar de piste van Gentbrugge te piloteren. En toen Rieten zijn ronde deed, dan riep hij tot de massa en dat is historisch, dat is geen mop. Ga je er maar naar huis weien en kom morgen terug. Ik lig een halve dag verrukt. The fourth name on the list was Jules van Hevel. He also won Paris Roubaix, the Tour of Belgium, and two national championships. Van Evel was desperate for a second successive win, something which had never been done. He'd already come third in 1919, but René Vermandel beat him by half a wheel. In 1922, that suited Leon de Vos. The worse the weather, the better he went. This was the bitterest day so far. And finally, a foreigner won, Henri Souter of Switzerland. The foreign interest in the race had been growing steadily, and a Belgian might have won yet again if Christian de Reiter, in the middle of the picture here, hadn't punctured in mid-sprint. And what the Belgians lost in 1923, they gained in 24 and also in 27, because Gerard de Bartz won both years. Tussenin schrijven we de namen bij Van Delbeck en Verschuren. Een overwinning in de ronde van Vlaanderen. Winning the Flanders in 29 was the high point of Jeff de Vez's career, just as it had been for Jan Mertens, yet another Belgian the previous year. After de Vez came Frans Bonduel. His race was really Paris Brussels. He won it twice, came second three times and third once. The race was in those days a terrible race over appalling roads. From start to finish in those days the route of the Tour de Flanders was awful. It was cobbles, cobbles, cobbles everywhere. Or there were narrow little cycle paths. It was different in the Ardennes, of course. There were tar roads in the hills, or there were cement roads, and the roads got wider and wider. But in the beginning, it was just inhuman for the riders. And here's the man who inflicted all that misery, Karel van Weinendaal, with his wife at the start of the 16th Tour of Flanders. And here are the favourites, Jeff de Muizere, second in the Tour de France the previous year, and George Rons, already twice world champion. And the Delure brothers, who went on to win the first two tours of Spain. There were 120 riders at the start on the 13th of March 1932. There were some unfit, untried legs among them. Until the middle of the 1930s, the Tour of Flanders was the opening event of the Belgian road season. Ordinary folk went by tram. And even in these days, when only the rich could afford a car, there were enough toughs about to create a traffic jam of spectators behind the race. The police tried to sort it out, but of course they got stuck in the jam as well. Up front things were less comfortable, either you chose the narrow cycle path on the left or the bone jarring of the road on the right. And that being the case, you used heavy tyres, 500 grams every one of them, or about a pound and an ounce apiece. And if you punctured, you fixed it yourself, hoping your gonfleur was up to the job. One squirt of compressed air, and it didn't give you a second chance. The favourites were up there. Romain Giesels, the winner of the year before, and the young Fons de Lure. De Lure lost, and so Giesels became the first man to win in successive years. And it wasn't a bad year for him, either. He also won Bordeaux Paris and Paris Roubaix. 
1933 went to one of the fast strongmen, Von Scapers, who was also second the following year. The big names were out again the following year in the shadow of Ghent's St. Peter's Station, almost where Ghent track stands now. Sylvia Maas, the last Belgian to win the Tour de France in the 30 years to Eddie Merckx. Gaston Rebry, he just won Paris-Nice and the others were scared of him. Franz Bonduel was always up there too, right up there until after the Second World War. A lot of the reporters are backing Edouard de Calloway. Lode Ardequest is here for the third time. Gust van Tricht rode the Tour in 1931 as an individual, without a team. Despite the weather, 160 riders are away dead on time at 8.30. It's the biggest field so far. They enter Bruges. An accident knocks out De May and Ardikest. A break of eight riders led by Bogart. The andere zeven Crosswind zeven torment de the seven chasers. Then it's Verlinden who leads the big bunch. At 79 kilometers, they reach Ostend. Then there's a bad crash at Torhout. De Muzier and Jolly are the worst hurt. One hundred and twenty five kilometres and the feeding station. The two leaders have now six minutes. Then Verveik is dropped on the Idelar climb. Rebri, the locomotive, is away alone. Scapers drops Notaman and attacks. And the Tour de Flanders after Paris-Nice is Rebri's second most important win in 1934. Two weeks later, he won Paris-Roubaix as well. Veteran Rebri wins by 15 seconds. He won here and he won Paris-Roubaix three times. Scapers catches Verveik and comes second. Now there are 140 riders and the weather's still as bad. Only half the field is still in the race by half distance. A puncture de Lonka. De Keisha punctures and chases back. Rebri still leads at Blankenberg. This is his break. Romain Mace, Den Eichels, Nemens, Rooms and De Poe. They've been away since Eclo. Rebri still leads near Ostend station.
called Trike. Lehmans and Rebri are away. Rebri punctures and chases through Zwevergum. Lehmans forges on through Knocker. On the Quarimont, Rebri and Lehmans rejoin. The lead is growing. In the second group is the Calloway and Bonduel. And then there's an accident when a press car hits a lorry and there are casualties. Le Mans leads at Opfasselt, but the others are chasing. And at the finish, Jewel who heads a tough sprint to win. With his win in the Belgian Championship two years earlier, this was the most important success in Louis Duelou's career. Never had a race been so popular. Liège Baston Liège is older and so is Paris Bruxelles and the Shell the Grand Prix, but the Flanders was the most popular of them all. Right from the start, people were curiously fond of the Tour of Flanders. I think that's because right from the 1920s, anyone who had a car or a motorbike could follow it. By the 1930s, it was becoming really dangerous. So much so, that in 1934 it was written in the papers that there'd be ten motorbike highway police and three police cars during the race to throw anyone out of the caravan who was nothing to do with it. But it didn't really work, and in 1938 the state police stepped in to keep the race separate from the followers. In 1938 is er voor het eerst dus een uh, Rijkswerkbrigade in de, in de ronde gekomen. Voor de orde aan tafel tussen de volgers. The headline, Sportswedel's Tour de Flanders sticks to Sunday, April the 2nd. So what you say? Well, nothing really except that Sunday, April the 2nd was election day in Belgium and voting compulsory. So they shortened the distance to 230 kilometers so that everyone could go out and vote. The Belgian Tour Vedette krijgt een extra aandacht van onze cameraman. Watch out for the man on the left. Cass, the unexpected, shows his character on the Quarimont. Canal Cass was a wonderful track rider. You could see that in his smoothness. But oh, said the pundits, he's too lightly built for a tough race like the Tour of Flanders. But Cass thought otherwise. He came straight from the six days to the cobbles. You could never be sure what you'd get next in the Flanders. There were the obstacles you knew would turn up, the cobbles and the cycle paths, 
and sometimes there'd just be an old gent on a bike out there for a ride in the opposite direction. And, the and even the when they'd sorted out the caravan, the sheer number of people driving on the course gave the organisers real headaches. Four riders reached Alst in the lead. Their cast, Roman Mace, Edward Vlieses and, hanging back, Van den Dries. But there was no doubting the gap at the finish. Cars, Mace and Vlieses. The name should have been familiar. Five years earlier, before taking his charge on the track, Cars had been world road champion in Leipzig at the age of 20. The Second World War didn't stop bike racing in the way the First War had. The Germans were in occupation, but racing continued, especially in Flanders. This time the organiser didn't have to dream dreams for six years. The riders were there, the reporters were there, but so in their uniforms were the soldiers. Cars were scarce, the Germans had them, civilians by and large didn't, but the tram lines you notice were still as much a menace in Ghent as ever they were. There are now 50 miles left to go. And by the end of them, Archiel Buys, triumphant and alone in his hometown, the neighbours are every bit as pleased as he is. And next year, he did it all over again. The Hotel Continental St. Peter's Square, Ghent. The war has changed the face and the faces of Belgian cycling. There are new stars for the crowds in their raincoats and hats. There are older faces too. This is weer een jongere, Jacques Geus, met naast hem als jeune premier Lomedrisis. Lom Driesen, a young man here, is the man who claims to have brought Copy, Merckx and Freddie Mertens, especially Freddie Mertens, to fame. He was a team manager for many years and it's still impossible to sort out the stories that surround him. The tram lines again. Will they get across this time? Ah, yes. Flanders is a flat land with trees but no forests. The wind in these early season classics can blow straight off the North Sea in a gale and very often does, the bunch remains intact. Marcel Gint in the national jersey he wore in the Tour de France. 
Albert Rietzeveld and Achille Buys. 500 francs prime at the top and 8 get clear. Van Dijk attacks and takes place. Hendricks, Van Eyn Eymer, Bloemy, Schott, Van de Wegge with him. The race finished on the indoor track in Ghent, with thousands standing outside in their hats and coats. The cameraman's there as well, because he's already discovered the track's too dark for his film. So he stands outside to film shot, leading the rest inside. And afterwards, he drags Brick Schotter back outdoors, again to pose with the flowers and the boss of the newspaper that organised the race. The Tour of Flanders began the year before the First World War in 1914. Marcel Buys won, and now another Buys, Arkiel, the first man to win three times, 1940, 41 and 43. And finally, sound. You went to the cinema and you heard your heroes. One hundred and three riders leave Ghent for this, the first non-silent Tour de Flanders. All the favourites are here, says the commentator. Van Steenbergen, Vleming, Kint, 45 kilometres per hour. The gateway in Brugge, then the speed drops as the racers go through Roseler, straight into the wind as usual, still no break. And into the hills, the Quaramont. One climb down and Summers gets a handful of seconds. He stays clear over the Kreisberg and a group gets up to him in time for the Edelair. You rarely see pictures of the climbs themselves because the roads are too narrow and the old cameras still stuck up on the tripods were too large. And so you have to take my word for it that they did ride all the hills and that they're now 75 kilometers on the finish and going like trains with the wind behind them. And then there were three. Van Dijk is sick and he gives up, which leaves two 10 kilometers from the end. Except that the best riders in Belgium are chasing like Fury, Kint, Kleis and Van Steenbergen, and the leaders come back. And then there's some indecision about the best way into the track. Up hop the rest and Rick Van Steenbergen storms inside to win. Van Steenbergen cashes in as Kleis and Sterex crash. It's one of these curious facts that Rick Van Steenbergen's wife is a woman from Wigan who had no idea she was marrying one of the strongest and wiliest old bike riders in the land. And just in case you didn't realise, the cuddly looking chap on the right is, like the one on the left, Rick van Steenbergen. It wasn't easy racing during the war, eating enough was a problem and you couldn't get the equipment. In a lot of races we got paid in kind. And sometimes for the rest, well yes, we smuggled what we could from Holland. Smuggling, it's an ugly word, but things were different then. And for me, well, I was born right on the border in Arendonk. Smuggling was in our blood. This genial old man lives now in a castellated house a few miles from Antwerp. He sells verandas for a part-time job. For me, the best classic I ever rode was the 1946 Tour de Flanders. That was when I got to know a Van Steenbergen that later I seldom saw again. Not the man who rode economically and craftily, but an aggressive, attacking young Van Steenbergen. 
beredeneerd uitvoert, maar wel de agressieve aanvallende jongen van Steenbergen. Van Steenbergen dominates everyone, it says. Nobody would ever dispute that Van Steenbergen was the great man of the Tour of Flanders in 46. Six leaders, Schotter is there, and de Klerk, Van Steenbergen and the Frenchman Tietar. Together they got away on the descent of the Idela. And from then Van Steenbergen and Schotter powered their way clear, and then up came Tietar. Three miles from the finish, Van Steenbergen showed why they called him the Lion of Flanders. The national champion won the National Classic. Tiertard was second and Schotter as shattered as Van Steenbergen was third. But Schotter wasn't finished. There must have been, oh, about 25 of us away after the climb of the Quaramont. We got to Alst and we carried on through to the finish. And then I beat Ramon and Reckert in a straight sprint. We zijn de weg gegaan met vieren op het laatste. Klopt de Ramon in de sprint. Uh, Rijkwaard en Impanis. Of Impanis was er daarna. En we waren Rijkwaard vierde. Lines, of course, are known for the mane of hair. That was one thing that Fierenzi Magny could never boast. But the line, nevertheless, is the emblem of Flanders, and Magny tweaked its tail so often, 1949, 1950 and 51. So much so, the Italians called him Il Leone della Fliandre. Magny had the exact build for the Tour of Flanders. He was a powerful man and really quite a character, because he was always gossiping away during the race. But that was a bitterly cold day. Just three riders can stay with him all day long, and Manier just stayed there, daring anybody who felt strong enough to come by. Belgium calls it a day of shame. Foreigners took all the best places. The first Belgian, Rick van Steenbergen, was only sixth. He was 12 minutes off the back. It was a debacle. Twice more Manu won, each time riding better and better than the year before. De Kock won for Belgium in 1952, but then the little Dutchman Wim van Est in 1953 came along. Raymond Impanis may have won in 1954, but never again could the home nation guarantee he would win its biggest race. The little village of Gerardsbergen is notable only for its high street, which you can see is not like your average British high street. We know it better by its French name, Le Moeur de Gramont, the Wall of Gramont. On the climb, this was Louis and Bobet and Ferdi Kubler. There were a group of us got away, and we were maybe 20, 25 kilometers from the finish line. I noted that Bobet and Maha were talking about doing something together to shoot me off the back, so I counterattacked and Bobe was lost. Well, by then we had a lead of 50 seconds, so I started working with Mahé, and maybe 15 kilometers from the finish, 10 kilometers perhaps, I had the feeling that Mahé was easing up. I'd been up there for 205 kilometers, and I'd always been taking my turn. I didn't want it to go to a sprint though, so I just rode straight through, and 500 meters from the finish, Mahé had had it. There was no sprint. Nels was showing immediately before the start, including Karel van Weinendals. German Der Eich, winner of Peru Bay, the Flesh Wallon and Milan San Remo. Nesta Sterex, king of the Criteriums, is 32. Pino Cerami, a year older. And this is Jean Brankert, a rare French-speaking Belgian in the bunch. Rick van Steenbergen, not a single big win in 1955. Wim van Est, the first Dutchman to wear the Maillot Jaune. Hugo Koblet, the so-called charm peddler, riding for the first time. Luzon Bobet, world champion and won sixth and twice fourth, but never a Flanders winner. 
201 starters, a superb field, a dry day despite that puddle, but bitter cold. And it takes 13 kilometers for a group of 13 to move to the front. Van Steenbergen is among them. Met onder meer Van Steenbergen, Marcel Janssens, De Korte, de Nederlander Adrie Voorting en de Fransman Carrara. And on the Kleisberg, 150 kilometers on, Van Steenbergen does the damage. He gets to the top first and wins himself a washing machine. Gaultier, Dupont, Coblet, they have 2 minutes 20 to make up. And then comes Bobé. 3 minutes have passed since Van Steenbergen went by. Further back, it's Petrucci. There's a desperate fight now to limit the damage by the wall of Gramont, and some of the most dangerous bike riders in the world get into one little group. And Gautier, the four times winner of Paris Roubaix, obliges. Then Bobé. Van Steenbergen. And Hugo Koble. And they stayed away. Bobe, Van Steenbergen, Koble, and Gautier. Bobe's enormous thighs pounding the pedals. Van Steenbergen is desperate. He goes from well out. And Bobe and Koble ride by him. Bobe wins, Van Steenbergen is third and disappointed. 1955, that was the Tour of Flanders I don't like talking about. The hills had gone and Koble came up to me and Bobe and Gautier as well. And there were four of us then. And there were still four of us when we came to a village called Leiden. I think or something like that, about five kilometers from the finish anyway. We got to a barrier at a level crossing and it was down. The three foreigners climbed over it. They might be allowed abroad to do that, but I didn't know about it in Belgium. But they climbed over it anyway, so I followed. And I had this feeling that I could still win. And then an official's car came up to us from the Belgian Cycling Association, a Mr. van der Kerkhoff. And he said to me, Rick, he said, you've been disqualified. And I said, disqualified? And I tried hard in the sprint, but I just couldn't do it. And so I was beaten by Bobé anyway. And when as that he said he declassed, I I don't know if he was in my or if he was in the sprint, or if he was in the what I normally can in the sprint. Cost in the sprint. And I was stopped by Bobé. A couple of weeks earlier I'd won Milan San Remo and I thought it would be a great honour if I could come back to my own town and in front of my own people win the Tour of Flanders, our own Tour of Flanders. I rode well, but I was overconfident. That was the mistake I made. I attacked too early. I was by myself for 40 kilometers and I suffered because I so much wanted to win. And then a couple of kilometers from the finish I was caught by Rick van Steenbergen and the whole peloton. That was a really heavy blow to me and I felt it for a long time afterwards. I felt it particularly badly because to my mind those who'd caught me hadn't won the race either. The Frenchman who won it for example was never heard of again. I lost the 1956 race, but it taught me a lot in compensation. And the first thing that I learned is that you don't win only with your legs, but more with your head. And with that experience, I went to the start in 1957, and I resolved to do everything differently, because I wanted to win the Tour of Flanders, and therefore I had to do it differently. Nothing much happened in the first part of the race. There was a few breakaways, but nothing important. In fact, everything was pretty quiet. Then I had to make a decision. I got away with a few riders with me, and I knew the big battle would come on the wall of Gramont. I got over the top with about half a dozen others. 
The best thing was that I got clear without Rick Van Looy and I won the sprint easily. I'd done it. I'd achieved my goal as a professional by winning the Tour de Flanders. Op de muur ontstond een gevecht en er was reeds sprake van een tweestrijd van Louis de Bruyne op dat ogenblik. Ik kon echter op de muur met nog een zestal anderen wegraken zonder van Loy. Dat gaf mij vleugels. In de spurt won ik gemakkelijk, zal ik maar zeggen, alles was goed voorbereid. Mijn doel was bereikt. Ik had mijn ronde van Vlaanderen als beroepszinner gewonnen. With 85 kilometers to go, the leaders were Jermaine de Rijk, Marcel Janssens and Raymond Imparnes. De Rijk and Janssens stayed in a slightly higher gear on the wall of Grammont, and Imparnes vanished. The hopes of winning though dwindled when first four chasers and then another three caught up with them on the circuits through veterans. But de Rijk had something left and he won. Willy Troy was second. Conterno of Italy, third. The same place a year later, Fred de Bruyne's there again, and so too was Rick Van Looy. At the top, it was Van Looy in his national champion's jersey. There were about 12 of us away when we got to the wall of Gramont, and there was a prime at the top, and I sprinted for it. I attacked and de Bruyne stayed with me, and I thought, yeah, okay, and we worked together. But then, just before Alst, a bunch of 15 joined us as well. Gilbert Desmay attacked. Now, he was in the same team as me, but luckily for me, Franz Scruben went after him. And so I jumped too, and when it came to the sprint, ah, yeah, I won. We were four kilometers from Tannen, and I was with some good riders. Van Looy was there, for example, and he was in great form. I didn't give myself much of a chance in a sprint against Rick Van Looy. So, when I got to the front with 300 meters to go to the line, I just stayed there, and I won the sprint. If you wanted to win, you had to reckon with Van Looy. Tour de Cabuta clings to his wheel. His name means Arthur the Gnome, by the way. And then at the foot of the Kreisberg, sensation, the world champion crashes. And then a real chase begins to make up for lost time. But Van Looy has not a soul he can rely on for help. And in Zottegem, he gives up. That, for Belgium, is the story of the race. But not for us, because the last finish on Wetteren is the first Flanders win for Tom Simpson, and that marks the start of a career as a true international bike rider. He beats the Italian Nino Di Filippis. The town square in Bruges, 55 kilometers have passed. This is the bunch. Ahead of it, a commando of 14 led by Van Looy and six of his teammates. The reaction is all you'd expect, a frantic chase. There are no fewer than six echelons along the coast. The last one is still in Ostend, three minutes behind. Up at the front in Rossler, the battle's easier. In the hills, the best get to the front. Tom Simpson, Norbert Kerkhover, the Belgian champion Mikael Van Aarde, world champion Van Looy and his teammates Jeff Plankert and Noel Foray. Their lead varies from a minute to a minute and a half. It's demanding for Simpson. And Van Looy is glad of a closed level crossing to rest his stomach cramp. Before then, there'd been an attack of six or seven riders. Then we attacked and there were four of us left. 
Plankett was there and Foray and one of my teammates, but by the finish there was only me. Not for nothing did they call him the Emperor. He was alone and majestic as he swept into the race his new finish in Ghent Brugge for the first time. There's never a shortage of Belgians with nothing better to do than watch the Ronde, which clearly pleases Norbert Kerkhover. The Belgian champion, second in the Tour de France the year before. And Rudy Altig, second to Tom Simpson in the 1967 world title. And the national champion of Holland, Abby Geldermans. But there's only one favourite, Rick Van Looy. He's not just cold, he's also weakened. Plankett's not there to help him more than ever. It was Van Looy against the rest. Travel this road today and it surfaced, not in the early 60s though. The cobbles still bang you through the thin tar. The answer? You take to the only marginally less bumpy bike path. Van Zerenhutz breaks the race open, and who's he working for? Rick Van Looy? The shifting is gebeurd met vooraan hier Simpson, Pulido, Tom Simpson, Raven Pulidor, Van Itzen, and then there were two. Pulidor and Van Looy. With Simpson behind, with Van Itzen, Van Erde and Foray. I suppose it was about four or five kilometers from the finish. Jules van Merlenbeke and Simpson jumped away and Altig and Mekelbeek got up there as well. And there were four of us when we got into the finishing lap. Altig crashed. I was watching out for the others and normally I'd have been beaten by Franz Mekelbeek, but I was feeling great, so I thought it would be worth making a surprise attack. I jumped and I got three or four lengths. Noel Foray had just ridden the fastest Tour of Flanders in history, 40 and a half kilometers an hour. Belgian borders the North Sea. Rarely does it rise more than a few feet and the wind blows mercilessly in spring. Yet despite it all, Altig is a superhero this day. There are 60 kilometers to go and he's ridden the competition off his wheel. Rick Van Looy, Peter Post, bit and bit to bring him back. But Altig is unstoppable. Not just alone, but faster ever than Foray, 41 kilometers per hour in fact. It's the first time a German has won Flanders, and how. Another four minutes will pass before the next rider crosses the line. An easy start, and a hard end. I broke away on the Volkenberg, and then I was with Ward Sels, and we were working together. At the start, Sels was just so terribly strong. But then later, closer to the finish, I could sense he was weakening, that he wasn't no longer as strong, and that inspired me to win even more. For Yodoro, it was his sixth classic win in four years. Just a kid, but the Tour of Flanders itself was now well into middle age. This was race number 50. In the middle of this crash is a rider of whom folk are already saying quite a lot about. His name, Eddie Merckx. But for him, like Walter Godefroot and a few others, the race was already over. This was Willy Plankert and Gianni Motta. And from the hell of the cobbles, a leading group of 14 established. And from them, Ward Sells, who'd been one of the world's best single-day riders for years, finally got out from under the shadow of Rick Van Looy. Gerante of Italy and Belgium's Van den Berg and Willy Plankert. Good, but not good enough. A life and death struggle, Noel Foray and Dino Zandegu. 
Foray is the home rider, but Zandegu is fresher. Foray had already been away by himself before the Italian had caught up. And who was the hero had been caught napping? Eddie Merckx. And wherever Merckx went, so Felici Gimondi followed behind, protecting Zandegu. It's a hard ride even on Merckx's wheel. Merckx had already won his second Milan San Remo and Gamp Wavelgum. Barry Hoban and Willy Monti were also chasing. Foray just didn't have the strength though to come by in the sprint and Zandigu wins his first classic race. Not bad for an oldie, you're looking at a man of 34 and this was his final big win. Everything happens on the wall. This time the moves come from Ward Sells, Poulidor and Eddie Merckx. And that's Rick Van Looy. Now watch closely. Does this look like a world champion whose front forks are breaking? But they are. So the master gets a new bike for the final 50 kilometers. But look at the gap. Walter Godefroot is as fresh as they come. The Tour of Flanders, pretty simple so far, he says. Good weather, although they're averaging 42 kilometers an hour. Van Looy's already lost Merckx's wheel once this race. Now he's more careful. Guido Raybrook, the mouse, plays while the big cats watch. And then pounce. It was just one of those classic sprints. Walter Grotefroot gets it in front of Rudy Altig and the Dutchman Jan Janssen. Walter Grotefroot has beaten some of the world's best sprinters. This was a great year, and this, Eddie Merckx. Walter Godefroot, Felici Gimonde, and Raymond Poulidor. Notice the difference in the Quaremont? Well done, they've tarred it over. This makes it easier, which means there are 31 riders with Merckx instead of the expected half a dozen. So what does he do? He goes to the front and stays there. And he just rides everyone off his wheel. They're shattered just from trying to stay with him and there are still 75 kilometers to go. We'd say it was brave out there in the wind and rain. Lom Driesens, his team manager, said, You're mad, Eddie. Plain mad. A puncture for Gimondi, but what does it matter when Merckx has already got five minutes? Nobody has ridden the Tour of Flanders like this since Fiorenzi Magni in 1951, but Merckx has already been away even longer than that and ridden quicker. You're watching the greatest performance has ever been in a Tour of Flanders. Another five and a half minutes are to pass before the next sorry figure makes his way up this road, Felici Gimondi. I never actually attacked. I just kept the tempo going at the front in the ordinary way and, well, a gap appeared. I looked around at Potosi and I could see he couldn't make it. So I just carried on. And then at a particular moment, I knew what I had to do. Is, is, it that, yeah, is it true, asked the reporter, that when you had a minute's lead, your team manager came up to you and you asked if you should let the others catch you? Yes, I wasn't sure. I knew that in the stretch after Ninova, the wind would be strongly in my face. I'd be riding straight into it and I wasn't sure what to do. But, well, everything turned out okay. Eddie. 
Andy, you've been close for If the television reporter looks strangely familiar, well, it's Fred de Bruyne who won this race in 1957. Eddie, he says, you're seen as the favourite today, but how do you feel about it? And Eddie replies, well, to be honest, I feel a bit nervous because it's a big race and you're bound to feel nervous, but everybody else must be feeling the same way. So then de Bruyne goes off to find Patrick Sercou and they start talking about the weather. Oh, says Patrick, I'm pretty much wrapped up against the wind, but I just hope it doesn't rain. And what's that on your knee then, says Fred? And Patrick says, it's to keep his knees warm because he's been hurting a bit lately, probably from the cold, he says. Which seems to exhaust that topic, so he moves on to Roger de Vlaminck. Do you know what the prizes are in this race, he says? And Roger says, what? And Fred says, the prizes, Roger. How much are they? Oh, the prizes, replies Roger, as if it was the first he'd heard of them. I haven't the faintest idea. So Fred says, not even the winners? To which Roger guesses about 10,000 francs, probably. This was a race anyone could win. Rick Van Looy. Roger Pangeon, who won the Tour de France the year that Tom Simpson died in 1967. The Alps didn't trouble him, but here on the wall he's weakening. Eddie Merckx, soon to be called the cannibal for boiling the opposition alive. Oh dear, how the mighty have fallen. Merckx has saved Belgian cycling and he's brought back the spirit of copy. Eddie, 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 wherever he goes, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie. Those who can struggle in his tracks. Ten kilometers to go, Pangeon is nowhere. It has to be Merckx, Godefroot or Eric Le Mans. Tragedy strikes Merckx, a puncture in the final kilometer, Godefroot is powerful but weakening and Eric Le Mans wins his first Tour de Flanders. Merckx is third. Try as he might, Merckx could not get clear. Others would try. In the end, everything hung on the final attack. In this case, it was the Dutchman Yves Dolman. It was the biggest win of his career and it was entirely unexpected. And who is the world champion at the front again? Eddie Merckx. And this was Tony Hubrex. But he gets nowhere. But Merckx has only to sneeze and Eric Le Mans will be with him. They get 20 seconds on the field. 
Voorbij de Steenbeekberg geraken Merckx en Le Mans 20 seconden voorop. Maar Felice, well, Felice Gimondi, Gimondi drags the bunch back up to them both. There are now 10 kilometers to go and the final decision has been taken. There are seven left by Gentbrugge. Merckx, Le Mans, Verbeek, Dierichs, Rosier, Schwertz and Willy de Geest. Le Mans will take it. Second is Dierichs, third Verbeek, fourth de Geest and fifth Rosier. And seventh, Eddie Merckx. En zevende Merks. Erik Le Mans is in de ronde opnieuw boven zichzelf uitgegroeid. In 1973, Belgian television made a report about reporting. To get a bike race onto the screen involves huge numbers of people and a massive amount of equipment. But once upon a time, it was all very different. At first, the cameraman worked from inside a car. It was a difficult and sometimes impossible task. So they tried putting the camera on top of the car. It was better, but the cameraman could die of cold. When the cameras got smaller, the competition became bigger. And when TV started, there were only fixed cameras. Which meant the coming of mobile cameras was a revolution. You are now sitting in front of your TV right in the middle of the race. And as soon as cameras started going into helicopters, the coverage of bike races was close to perfection. As the riders began their journey, the last details were being drawn up at the finish line in Meerbeke to get the pictures back. De bevoorrading verloopt probleemloos. Het is wachten op de grote strijd. Aan de aankomst And still at the finish, the final instructions were given. Transmission was about to begin. The helicopter was in position. And the motorbikes with the mobile cameras are ready now to move up to the leaders. A group still 13 strong. The calf is al van het koren gescheiden. The finale kan beginnen. Over to Fred de Bruyne. 
Wattig hebben ze een goede namiddag van het Meerbeek, waar wij dan straks de aankomst krijgen van de Ronde van Vlaanderen. Nu weet het voor de eerste maal dat de Ronde van Vlaanderen aankomt hier in Meerbeek. L'arrivo quest'anno è a Meerbeek, è stato cambiato il traditionale arrivo a Gentbrugge, che era la All the famous cycling nations were taking these pictures on direct. They were live. And we sit here now the beide leiders met van de vijf. And these are the two leaders, says Fred, who's probably the most popular commentator Belgium's ever had. Frans Verbeek is there, he says, and Walter Godefoot, Patrick Sercou, and Eddie Merckx. The renders are in Gerardsberg. And from the wall in Gerardsberg, in the control room, what was expecting the best pictures of all. Ja, meneer, leuk. Blijf maar gerust, blijf maar gerust staan. We gaan daar nog de groep nemen als de groep er komt. En daar gaan we vertraging van teruggeven als het de moeite is. These were heady days, the cameras bringing you now within inches of the riders and drama on the road. Franz Verbeek has a puncture. Britain too had her own pioneering commentator. After already having completed 140 miles and the rain which has been threatening all day. This was David strong, Saunders. Gusty wind and now the rain is beginning to fall slightly as we come back down onto the road. And that freezing rain and driving wind made the finish tougher than ever, and it was dangerous too on the slippery roads, and not just for the riders. From the safety of his cabin, De Bruyne points out De Mont, Roger de Vlaming and Eddie Merckx. A mishap puts de Vlaming out of the leaders group. There are just four for the finish now, Merckx, Martins, Eric Le Mans and Willy de Geest. This is the last right line with Freddy Merckx. Martins leads. Before Freddy Merckx and Eric Le Mans. Martins trekt zich op gang. The cameras are waiting. Then Merckx takes the lead, then the Le Mans, and then the Geest. Then Martins goes first. But Eric Le Mans gets round him and then Mertens comes charging back, but he dies and Le Mans is the first man since Freer and Zermagny to win the Tour of Flanders three times. En dan toch Freddy Martens die zeer goed terugkwam op het laatste. And Fred takes six million Flanderians through the final meters again, out of vision but nevertheless helpfully pointing out the riders and their moves on his screen. Freddy Martens die zich vrij maakt en komt hier zeer gevaarlijk naast Erik Le Mans spurten. Dus als het geleden jaar van jou. Wel, ik ik heb me voorbereiden. Tradition has it the home nations provide the pictures, but the commentators conduct the interviews. So while you watch and hear Eric Le Mans talking to Fred De Bruyn, every other nation is seeing Eric Le Mans, but listening to their own man interview their own hero, be it Italian or Dutch or French or British or whatever. Nobody thinks this is at all odd. Each nation has runners to go and fetch the heroes, which is why Eddie Merckx is about to tell Flemish television why he became third to Freddie Mertens. You could no more support Eddie Merckx and Freddie Mertens in the 60s than you could like both the Rolling Stones and the Beatles in the same period.